It's my great honor to introduce our LRA president, Dr. Betsy Baker of the University of Missouri Columbia. We owe her and our entire LRA leadership team a great debt of gratitude for shepherding us through the necessary change from an in-person to an online LRA conference. While I know for certain that the idea of a virtual LRA never crossed Betsy's mind when she agreed a few years ago to run for the position as LRA vice president, we couldn't be in better hands. As we'll hear in a few minutes throughout her career, Betsy's scholarship has been centrally concerned with the role of technology in literacy education and research. Most recently, she's been exploring beginning readers' use of speech recognition software as they compose their own language experience texts. She found that children not only learn to read the words they dictate, but they also form strong identities as readers and writers. However, she reminds us that children aren't immune to the challenges that we all face when we dictate text into our phones. When Siri is in charge, Jack and Jill might just go to hell instead of down the hill. But if you know Betsy, you won't be surprised that these little glitches haven't deterred her interest in learning technologies one bit. Instead, first, she recommends that we use good child protection software and otherwise embrace series errors as opportunities for learning. When kids complain, that's not what I said, Betsy sees this as an authentic opportunity for a phonics lesson or a spelling lesson. Dr. Baker has published her research in the most prestigious literacy journals, and in 2008, her research was recognized by receiving the International Literacy Association's Computers and Reading Research Award. Betsy's innovative approaches to teaching were also recognized in 2011 when she received the Ernest L. Boyer International Award for Excellence in Teaching, Learning, and Technology that was given by the Conference on College Teaching and Learning. As literacy researchers, we are all the beneficiaries of her visionary use of podcasts to promote our research. We know her as the developer and first host of the Voice of Literacy podcast, where RRQ and JLR authors are interviewed about the findings and implications of their research. In 2020, when learners and teachers from preschool to university are learning and communicating online, it's hard to think of research that's more relevant and more timely. We're fortunate to have her at the helm of LRA, and we look forward to hearing her presidential address. LRA 2020, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. It's a thrill to be with you today. It's an honor to serve as president of LRA and to give the 2020 presidential address. So let me get straight to it. In 2005, Don Liu gave what I considered a riveting LRA presidential address. He challenged the LRA community to consider two questions. One, why do schools not prepare students for the new literacies of the internet, especially in the US and especially in economically challenged school districts? Number two, why do literacy researchers not focus their attention on the new literacies of the internet, helping schools to prepare students for their literacy futures? 15 years have come and gone, and I wonder if these questions persist. In the spring of 2020, schools across the country and world closed. COVID-19 reached pandemic proportions. Some schools provided worksheet packets for students to complete. Some provided video conferencing between teachers and students. Some moved components of their curriculum to virtual learning. During the fall of 2020, we saw more of the same. The digital divide became more obvious as students who lacked opportunities to secure worksheet packets, join video conferences, or go online were declined access. Little is known about whether those who had online access had the requisite digital literacies to engage in meaningful learning. Were schools prepared? Was there a research base available to help schools prepare students for reading and writing digital texts? Can the LRA community support parents, teachers, administrators, and policymakers as they strive to meet the needs of students who have been thrust online? 
Can we do a better job of supporting students in their learning to communicate with digital texts? Are digital literacies foundational, even prerequisite to online learning? In an attempt to ascertain whether digital literacies have entered the public consciousness, I did what I think most of us would do. I did a Google search. How many matches do you think I found for the keywords digital literacies? The answer is A, three million. I thought this was pretty good, but I really wasn't sure what it told me, so I decided to step it up and do a Google Scholar search. I limited my search parameters to the years since Lou's presidential address, so 2005 to present, and set the source parameters to journals. According to Google Scholar, in the past 15 years, how many journal articles have been published? Just journal articles. The answer is B, 577,000. Next, I limited my search to digital literacies. What percent of this 577,000 journal articles included the words digital literacies? The answer is A, one half of 1%. To be honest, I'm not sure what this tells me either. I'm not sure if we're getting the job done or not. I do know that when faced with a pandemic, Lou's questions resounded in my ears. I wondered, can we do more? Can we do better? Can we support schools and prepare all students to be proficient readers and writers of digital texts? I wonder if one roadblock is the perception that students know how to use digital forms of information and communication technologies better than the adults in the room. I hear and repeat the following sentiment. If you don't know how to use, say, a technology, ask a child or a teenager. Evidence suggests, however, that students are proficient with the few technologies they and their friends use, but may lack a full spectrum of other capabilities. We cannot assume they acquire or develop a robust range of digital literacies. To ignore a full complement of digital literacies in our research and schools is comparable to assuming children will develop alphabetic literacies and have no need of reading or writing instruction. A strategy for making sense of a phenomenon is to identify its basic characteristics. If you want to make sense of name three things, maybe your favorite flower, uh, the value of exercise, maybe a persistent threat like coronavirus. You need to identify the phenomena's defining characteristics. Throughout my career, I've sought to identify some of the defining characteristics of literacy in our digital world. The characteristics that I have identified are shaped by sociocultural precepts that have emerged primarily as I conducted naturalistic studies. It's my hope that a brief exploration of these characteristics will provide footholds that we can use to support schools and students as we continue to live in an ever-increasing digital world. My goal today is for you to walk away with an understanding of four characteristics of digital literacies. None of these are surprising or earth-shaking until we peel back some layers, dig deeper, and scrutinize the implications for literacy research, learning, and pedagogy. Today, I invite you to consider the nature of literacy in our digital world and brainstorm how we, as a community of literacy researchers, might coalesce our efforts to support students and schools. My cognitive background tells me I should provide an anchor, a shared experience to which we can refer and compare our divergent experiences. Here is a two and a half minute trailer for the 1997 movie, Wag the Dog. This movie was an adaptation of a 1993 satirical novel, American Hero. The basic plot is that just before re-election, the American president is caught in a scandal. So. A spin doctor creates a fake war to distract the American press. For me, Wag the Dog can be used to illustrate some basic characteristics of literacy in our digital world. There's a crisis in the White House. What's the crisis? And the president's top advisors have been called together. Oh, jeez. The sexual misconduct occurred inside the Oval Office. With the election only days away, how much will this scandal affect the outcome? The president spent the weekend pressing the flash. He wasn't campaigning, he was dating, actually. 
Now, Washington's top spin doctor. We can distract the press for 11 days till the election. I think we got a chance. Has an idea. We can't afford a war. We're gonna have the appearance of a war. But he can't pull it off without Hollywood's top producer. Uh, do I know you? We have some mutual friends in Washington. Why come to me? We want you to produce. You want me to produce your war? Not a war, it's a pageant. We need a theme, a song, some visuals. We need, you know, it's a pageant. New Line Cinema presents... How close are you to this? What do you want the kid to say? All the spectacle. I know we're all concerned for the president. I know we're all concerned for the president. I know uh, that we are all concerned for the president. He didn't, he didn't sell the line. All the drama. The president's going to go to war with Albania in about 30 minutes. Albania's hard to ride. These are chips. We need it for the armed position on the screen. It'll be a kit, and we'll punch it in later, right? And all the effects of real war. OK, put the, the village behind her. Give me some sound of screaming. <laughs> Without the casualties. America has seldom witnessed a more poignant picture. They used the same process with the last Schwarzenegger movie. You're the man. Albania, Albania. That rhymes? I can't believe it. We forgot a hero. It was like we sent him the Christmas card and we left out the what do you call? Fruitcake. There you go. Sergeant Schumann, if I may, welcome to history. How are you? Anybody want a beer? Because I could party. When it's cooking, it's cooking. From Academy Award-winning director Barry Levinson. When this goes national, I get to put it on my resume? Actually, no. What, what could they do to me? I think they'll to your house and kill you. Academy Award winner Dustin Hoffman. This is politics at its finest. Academy Award winner Robert De Niro. How would you like an ambassadorship? That's my fail. Well, I just do it for a story to tell. Oh, no, you couldn't tell anybody. Just, I'm just kidding. No, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean couldn't tell anybody. No, no, no. It's just a, it's a, it's, it's a pageant. It's a pageant. That's what it is. Wag the dog. When the fit hits the shan, somebody's going to have to stay after school. Before I explain the illustrations of digital literacies that I derive from Wag the Dog, let me settle my nerves. I have to be honest with you, I'm not a public speaker. I don't even lecture in my own university classes. When I received the news that I was elected to become president of LRA, I was overwhelmed. First, by the truly profound honor to serve as president of my favorite research organization and support our mission to conduct and disseminate literacy research. Then I was overwhelmed by the horror of giving this talk. In addition, I have to admit that I was also a little offended because I've always thought that LRA presidents were typically old fogies. Uh, then it occurred to me I looked up how to give TED Talks. The first rule is to talk no longer than 18 minutes. I strongly considered the option. I sought the wise counsel of LRA past presidents. They consistently recommended that I talk about what I know. Well, that created a whole new dilemma. One thing I know is that many thanks are in order. I'm deeply indebted to my parents, Maud and Walt Baker, who fostered a love of learning, curiosity, and advocacy. My elementary school colleagues who supported me as I struggled to promote autonomy for all learners. My graduate school mentors, Tom Clower, Vicki Risco, Debbie Rowe, John Bransford, among others, who invited me to become a member of a supportive and invigorating graduate community and quickly became not only mentors, but also good friends. My advisor, Chuck Kinzer, I warned Chuck that once he was my advisor, he would always be my advisor. He mentored me into LRA and the field. During invigorating conversations about my research dreams and aspirations, I can still see Chuck lean back in his brown naugahyde swivel chair, smile from ear to ear, and ask, so what? Who should care about the research you're doing? This has been a useful heuristic to live by. Thanks, Chuck. I wouldn't be here without you. I thank Don Liu, Linda Labeau, David Reinking, Mike McKenna, Donna Alverman, to mention a few, for forging the pathways of new literacies and digital literacy scholarship. You are preeminent among the scholarly giants on whose shoulders I stand. I thank the many editors and reviewers through the years of LRTMP, JLR, RRQ, and other publications who patiently and gracefully mentored me through the publishing process. Knowingly and unknowingly, many of you, the members of LRA, have mentored and continue to mentor me. 
I read your articles, listen to your podcasts, attend your conference sessions, work with you on committees, and collaborate with you to conduct and disseminate research. Your work invigorates and inspires me. LRA has been my academic home for over 25 years. You are my research community. It's a privilege to be a part of LRA. Do you usually look at each other's screens? From my seat, I can see Bert, Jacob, and Jesse's computers. Yeah, so I can see what my classmates wrote. My classmates are curious about my stories about. People come by and look at my computer screen. I think there are times that they do learn from each other. Carolyn observed other people. Well, she had to do that for a little while, and then when somebody actually taught her the steps to go through to use an app, you saw her comfort level. She was tickled, so tickled. These are quotes from my 1995 dissertation. Given a sociocultural view of reading and writing, I sought to understand the basic nature of literacy in our digital culture. If reading and writing are social acts, and cultural norms are situation bound. I wondered, what is literacy in our technology imbued culture? How could I be a literacy researcher and teacher educator if I didn't know what constitutes the essence of literacy in our increasingly digital world? The focus of my address is to revisit four characteristics of literacy that emerged during my dissertation and pull these threads through time. My hope is to grapple with the tectonic shifts we have encountered during the digital revolution and expose implications for reading and writing in our digital world. Using ethnographic research methods in a fourth grade classroom where students were outnumbered by computers, there was evidence that a basic characteristic of reading and writing was that it was public. The teacher, Mrs. Jones, explained, I definitely think that the writing is public in this classroom. The disadvantage of compositions being up on the computer screen, I think sometimes children in their journal writing are not as open. In fact, I did journal writing with second graders last year without computers. They wrote in their notebooks every day, and so they knew that the notebook was theirs, and they gave me permission to read it. If I got permission to read it, I read it. Otherwise, I did not read their journals. These children, using computers, when they do journal writing, it's more for a reader, somebody else to read it. It is putting our thoughts down on paper, expressing ourselves, but you know you're going to have an audience. I definitely think that they walk around and read each other's screens. In this interview, Mrs. Jones highlighted the notion that not only was literacy public, but that this publicness altered what students wrote. The second graders who wrote on paper had their privacy protected. The fourth graders who composed on computers could see one another's screens from where they sat. On one hand, students learned from each other by walking by and reading each other's screens. On the other hand, Mrs. Jones believed that they filtered what they wrote because they had both solicited as well as unsolicited audience members. Fast forward 20 years. In 2015, working with a team of researchers, we parsed the literature to consider whether the public nature of literacy in our digital culture remained a viable construct. To pull this thread through time, let me first consider where we were as a digital culture in the 1990s. The first web page was released in 1991. Within four years, Mosaic, Netscape, eBay, and Yahoo were online. Can you guess when Internet Explorer was released? It was 1995. How about Amazon? 1995. Any guesses on when Google came online? 97. Skype was 2003. Facebook, 2004. YouTube, 2005. In 2006, Twitter was launched. In 2007, the iPhone came out. By 2010, we had WhatsApp, Uber, Bitcoin, and Instagram. As you can imagine, user data increases followed suit. It's estimated that in 1990, half of 1% of the world population was online. By 2016, approximately 3.4 billion, or 46% of the world's population, 
had used the internet in the previous three months. Can you guess where the US ranked? While it might be hard to see, the top green line is North America, and just below that is the US. In 2016, it was reported that the US ranking for percent of the population that had used the internet within three months was tied with Lebanon and the Czech Republic as 33rd in the world, with 76% of the population online. By 2019, 90% of U.S. adults reported using the Internet. It's estimated that between 2010 and 16, on average, each day, 640,000 people went online for the first time, which equates to 27,000 new people online each hour. As of 2020, I'm going to guess that on any given day, it's likely that you will pick up a digital device to communicate or find information. One of my favorite examples of the public nature of digital literacies is work done by an MIT professor and executive director of the MIT Media Lab, Dr. Deb Roy. From 2013 to 17, Roy served as Twitter's chief media scientist. Roy and his team examined the transactional relationship between TV viewing and Twitter participation. In this case, Roy follows tweets that occurred during the British TV show, The X Factor. In white is the viewing audience. Roy uses DataViz to trace the life of one tweet. You'll see that an audience member, Claire Hardy, tweets, Sharon Osbourne is just the best ever. I'm laughing uncontrollably, hashtag X Factor. The gray bands represent time. You'll see that Claire Hardy posted her first tweet at about 8.30. Within a few seconds, someone reads Claire's post. You see that person circled in red. Over the next couple of hours, Claire Hardy's tweet is picked up by others and extends even beyond the broadcast viewing time. So far, we can see the public nature of literacy by noting Claire's ability to post to Twitter, and her post is read by several people. But I want to push the public nature of digital literacies a bit further. Roy rolls back Claire Hardy's one tweet and takes a random sample of 1% of the TV viewing audience and traces their tweets. Roy describes a virtual tsunami of shared experiences between the TV viewing audience and Twitter users. Let me review. Claire, while watching The X Factor, posted a tweet, and that tweet had an audience. Thus, her digital composition was public. When 1% of the viewing audience was followed, we witnessed a virtual tsunami of public communication between TV viewers and Twitter users. Let me push the public nature of digital literacies even further. Represented on the bottom is TV broadcasting. In yellow, you see a Twitter user named Andrew Kitzenberg. One evening while watching the local news, Andrew looked out his window and realized he was witnessing the manhunt that ensued after the Boston Marathon bombing. Andrew takes to Twitter to describe what he sees out his window. His tweets get picked up, and he becomes part of live television. Roy describes how the TV audience becomes Twitter authors who become TV participants. He describes the author-audience transaction between TV and Twitter as a percolation of communication. I like that description. We are witnessing the percolation between TV viewing and Twitter posting. Not only did Claire Hardy have an audience, not only did 1% of the X Factor tweets become a tsunami, but Andrew Kitzenberg became part of the TV news. These examples are derived from only two media streams, television and Twitter. As we all know, these are but two of a plethora of digital communication platforms. In further analysis of the public nature of digital literacies, colleagues and I examined the shifting role of audience 
and audience awareness, and noted how in a digital world, the role of author and audience is blurred, which raises all sorts of intriguing research questions that are rife with pedagogical implications. See Baker Rosendahl Whitenack 2000, or better yet, create a conference hashtag and get the discussion going. The public nature of digital literacies is evident when we refer to online posts, hashtags, and videos that have gone viral. Who can forget the ALS ice bucket challenge? Such examples are now common. The planking challenge, the running man challenge, the mannequin challenge. On a recent Milwaukee news broadcast, there was mention of someone who wanted to support restaurant workers who are facing difficult times due to COVID. She created a Venmo challenge. Local woman spreading kindness with the help of social media. She is raising money to surprise restaurant servers. Take a look. Have you heard of the Venmo challenge? Venmo challenge? Yeah. No. Do you know what Venmo is? I do. So basically on social media, I asked my followers on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter to give 25 or 50 cents of the account. So that way we give it to the server. Okay. So I want to give it to you. So she raised, recently gave a $760 tip to that server at Stenny's Tavern. That server became incredibly emotional, said she's having surgery Monday and didn't know how she was going to pay for that surgery. Now that money will help her with her medical bills. In 1995, Mrs. Jones and her fourth graders reported that they could see one another's computer screens. And Mrs. Jones commented that her students were aware that they constantly had an audience in a classroom where there were more devices than students. Statistics indicate rapid and continued growth of internet access. Roy uses wonderful data viz to demonstrate the publicness of Twitter communication while watching television, as well as live news events, such that the audience becomes part of the story in real time. There are viral videos and social media challenges. Publishers and producers are no longer the gatekeepers. Anyone can garner an audience. Herein reside vast opportunities for research and pedagogy. Based on the persistence of the public nature of literacy in our digital culture, I'm gonna do something a little risky. I'm going to attempt to predict the future. I conjecture a grounded theory. The nature of literacy in our digital culture will continue and even become increasingly public. While such predictions are in danger of current and future ridicule, if there's a glimmer of insight, such predictions may help us prepare for the future. For example, consider how the public nature of literacy aligns with advances being made in collective and artificial intelligence. In 2015, my research team wrote, while collective intelligence is as old as society and exhibited by most forms of life, due to the public nature of digital communication, we are on the precipice of something previously unattainable. Consider Wikipedia, where editorship belongs to the collective or more recently to the approved collective. Consider GoFundMe, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and Donors Choose, where innovators and funders can find each other. There are massively multiplayer online games, which I'll pronounce as Moogs, and massively multiplayer online role-playing games, which I'll pronounce as Morgs, that are inherently public. From 2008 to 15, the International Genome Project solicited voluntary DNA uploads that were used to examine the age-old question regarding nature versus nurture's role in disease. There are online ratings that shoppers, moviegoers, university students can consult. There are rideshare apps such as Uber and Lyft that help you find strangers who are willing to give you a ride. It's said that during the era of Web 1.0, readers read the internet. During the years of Web 2.0, readers and authors collaborated. In the more recent era, of Web 3.0, given browser cookies and such, the internet reads the readers. All iterations require proficiencies with digital literacies. May I also point out they also provide fodder for research and have implications for schools. There is a plethora of affordances as well as challenges 
to the public nature of digital literacies. There is online bullying and disinformation. In 2014, Pew reported that 73% of adult internet users have witnessed online bullying, while 40% have experienced it. Greenwald points out that simultaneously online communication information is democratized and monopolized by stating, we are nearing the point where an idea banished by Twitter, Facebook, and Google all but vanishes from public discourse entirely. Anyone living in a country that allows open access to the internet can post to social media, give online ratings, as well as find and create collective intelligence. On the other hand, search engine algorithms arguably monopolize what we find online. At the click of a button, your site, your post, your collaborations, your collective can be made impossible to find or even removed. Such possibilities beg for in-depth literacy research and adroit pedagogy. In a 2019 Pew survey, can you guess the percent of Americans who understood that HTTPS URLs are secure? 30%. Can you guess how many stated they did not know whether phishing scams could occur on social media, websites, email, or text messages? 15%. You might argue that such low scores are related to the age of the participants. Remember, according to Prinsky, digital natives were born after 1980. At this time, digital natives refers to anyone under the age of 40. The Pew survey found that 18 to 29 year olds scored 50% on digital knowledge surveys, while those who are 65 and older scored 30%. If literacy is and continues to be inherently public, I wonder, what do I, what do we as a community of literacy researchers need to examine so that we can support all learners to proficiently read and write in our digital world? To learn about Alaska, Sally read her social studies textbook, which incorporated alphabetic text, illustrations, and photographs. Sally used this information to develop the parameters of her investigation and acquire keywords. Online, she found video clips of Alaskan lifestyles, interviews with Alaskans, and views of terrain and weather conditions, including sound effects of harsh winds and frozen lakes cracking during spring thaws. Finally, Sally searched the internet and found additional sources that incorporated various sign systems. This 1995 dissertation excerpt was meant to highlight the semiotic nature of literacy in the technology-rich fourth grade classroom where I did my study. It describes how Sally relied on multiple sign systems to understand life in Alaska. These sign systems were not merely different representations of the same information. They were interdependent representations. Specifically, the interviews with Alaskans revealed to Sally how their language was different from her own. The video of the terrain exposed Sally to how rocky and icy the mountains were. The howl of the wind and the deep moans of the cracking ice demonstrated how Alaska could be bitterly cold and different from her climate. These sign systems were interdependent and presented Alaska to Sally in ways that alphabetic text alone could not. While reading can be viewed as a psycholinguistic guessing game, digital literacies might be viewed as a semiotic guessing game, where we simultaneously sample alphabetic, linguistic, visual, auditory, gestural, and spatial cues. I recognize that the semiotic nature of literacy is nothing new or earth-shaking. There are many wonderful scholarly works, some composed by those attending this session, that expound the multimodalities, transmodalities, and intermodalities of digital literacies. However, I wonder if we have pondered the ramifications of such works. In 1999, the Biography Channel did a countdown of the most influential people of the second millennium, right? So that's 1000 to 1999. Among others, they featured the biographies of Susan B. Anthony, Peter the Great, Da Vinci, Mozart, Darwin, and Gandhi. To let you know how nerdy I am, all year I was on the edge of my seat, 
Who would they feature as the most influential person of the second millennium? They concluded the series by identifying Gutenberg, they argued that the ability to mass produce and distribute the written word transformed the world. Some say we are experiencing a Gutenbergian revolution. Digital texts and the ability to encode and share alphabetic, linguistic, visual, auditory, gestural, and spatial expressions beg the question. What is literacy in our digital culture? Are literacy teachers now expected to help students develop not only alphabetic reading and writing skills, but also help students proficiently communicate with digital texts that incorporate visual, auditory, spatial, and embodied sign systems? Should literacy teachers be teaching art, music, theater, and video production? Should there be a hierarchy of sign systems where we target alphabetic texts in the early grades and other sign systems in later grades? Should all sign systems and the orchestration of all sign systems be part of the literacy curriculum, K through 12? I'm intrigued by varied notions of time and space as they relate to literacy. Time travel captivates the imagination. Another admission of my nerdiness is that as a preteen, I was intrigued by H.G. Wells' 1895 classic, The Time Machine, which was followed by my mind being blown by Pierre Bowles' 1962 Planet of the Apes. For decades, even centuries, humankind has searched for a time machine. I've seen proclamations that the time machine has been invented. It's called reading and writing. Given a time-space perspective, it can be argued that alphabetic text defies time and space. We can read the words of Socrates, Tertullian, and Confucius without living in ancient Greece, Africa, or China. When children proficiently read and write alphabetic text, they can travel through time and space. Semiotic sign systems are not new. Cave drawings, petroglyphs, pictograms indicate humanity has communicated with multiple sign systems for millennia. What is new is that multimodal texts now travel at lightning speed through space. I can text, email, and post to social media. Wherever you are in the world, you can receive my message within seconds. I teach an online graduate course in which we examine varied information and communication technologies, ICTs. And we attempt to be metacognitive about the literacies we use. 14 years ago, I was able to move along a continuum of verbocentric to gestural texts. It's now a challenge to separate sign systems from ICTs. For example, we used to examine the literacies that were needed to read and write text messages, email, search engines, Twitter, and back channels. At the time, these were commonly alphabetically based ICTs. We progressed through multimodal ICTs, such as online catalogs, news, websites, and Facebook, and proceeded to visually-based ICTs, such as Instagram and YouTube. Then we discussed the digital literacies of augmented realities, as well as virtual realities where users interact as avatars. A few years ago, I had to restructure the course because this continuum grew opaque. Text messages, emails, and Twitter contain emojis, GIFs, photos, and videos. The days of reading as a psycholinguistic guessing game while making sense of alphabetic text now reside within the broader multimodal world. Research is needed to examine the semiotic guessing game. How do the reading and writing processes of a psycholinguistic guessing game compare? What's the relationship between sign systems? How do readers and writers orchestrate sign systems? This graph represents the number of people using social media from 2004 to 19. You'll see that the number of users goes from zero to nearly three billion people, starting from the bottom to mention a few. Snapchat, Pinterest, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Consider for a moment, what is the role of alphabetic text in these platforms? As a side note, just because I wasn't sure where else to mention it, I wonder whether emojis should be part of vocabulary instruction. 
In 2013, seven years ago, the United Nations reported that worldwide, more people own cell phones than have access to functioning toilets. Specifically, at that time, it was estimated that six of the approximately seven billion people on Earth had cell phones, while only 4.5 billion had functioning toilets. In 2019, Pew reported that 96% of Americans own a cell phone, and 81% of these are smartphones, which support multimodal communication through text, email, social media, and the like. I've described the ability of digital text to travel through space at the speed of light. We know less about the duration of digital texts and their ability to travel through time. I have books on my shelves that are over 100 years old. I hope my Facebook posts are not available in 100 years. Linguists argue that babies persist through the challenges of learning oral language because of the innate need to communicate. Likewise, because written artifacts can travel through time and space, authors persist with the craft of written expression. Now that multimodal texts travel through time and space, we are witnessing the explosion of digital information and communication. I wonder, what role does time and space have in the ontology of literacy? Might reading and writing exist because they afford travel through time and space? If this is the case, it seems plausible that digital literacies and those who develop digital literacy proficiencies are the ones who are poised to ride the time machine. It is therefore imperative that we help students proficiently produce and make sense of all forms of text. In 2005, Lou stated, the internet is not a technology issue, but a literacy issue. May I be so bold as to update this statement by asserting, text messages, emojis, giphys animations, email, internet searches, internet browsing, hyperlinks, discussion boards, wikis, Google Docs, podcasts, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, live streams, virtual field trips, moogs, morgues, augmented realities, virtual realities, virtual currencies, collective intelligence, artificial intelligence, and the like, are not merely technological advances, but literacy advances. In 1995, I concluded that Sally's investigation of Alaska was an example of the semiotic nature of literacy in a digital classroom. In the ensuing years, the semiotic nature of literacy has undergone a Gutenbergian revolution. While the specific apps and technologies will come and go, based on the persistence of the semiotic nature of literacy in our pre-digital and digital culture, I conjecture a second grounded theory. The nature of literacy in our digital culture will continue and even become increasingly semiotic. How can we prepare pre-service teachers, support in-service teachers, and help educational leaders navigate the semiotic literacy landscape? What research is needed to help students travel through time and space in our digital world? How can we, a community of literacy researchers, provide the requisite research, teacher preparation, and educational support. I've written a whole story. I like doing this. I wish I could write every day. This is cool. I'm gonna need that dragon because there's a bunch of hard words. These are quotes from a current research project where first graders use Siri, Dragon, Alexa, Hey Google, and other speech recognition apps to compose. Typically, we think of these apps as online assistants. While driving, we can say, hey, Siri, hey, Alexa, call Tom, or will it rain today, or how do I get to the closest McDonald's? But speech recognition can also take dictation. Children can talk and watch their robust cultural vernacular magically appear on screen. I like to say they can talk to read. In 1995, I found that the nature of literacy in a technology-rich classroom was public, semiotic, and the third thread I want to pull through time is that literacy was product-oriented. 
When I asked the fourth graders in Mrs. Jones's classroom whether they preferred to compose with a computer or paper and pencil, they made such comments as, it's easier and neater to read type stories. People cannot read cursive as well. It would take longer to publish with paper and pencil because I worry about handwriting. Using technology is easier and more fun than pencil and paper. For example, you can type faster than write with paper and pencil. These students explain that computers mitigated challenges they encountered when writing and reading handwritten texts. When asked about composing multimodal texts, students made such comments as, I like it better with imported graphics and video because you don't have to draw it by hand. I can't draw that good. I can't draw anything. What if you had to do a picture without imported graphics? I couldn't do it. It's easier to illustrate on computer. With computers, you can copy it and move it. And Simon showed me how he did that. Drawing with a computer is easier. These excerpts reiterate that literacy in this classroom was public, semiotic, as well as product oriented. This could be a vestige of the classroom norms because the curriculum was inquiry based with projects that culminated in presentations. In other words, the students were expected to share what they learned during their inquiries. To do so, they considered what products would best communicate their learning. Would a PowerPoint with bulleted alphabetic text be a good product? Should they create an animation or show some video clips? Here's another research topic. What digital literacies are needed to make a match between the digital products and the message you want to communicate? In Mrs. Jones's classroom, they had to consider the affordances of digital products. When, why, and how can students choose one digital product over another? When, why, and how can students make PowerPoints, websites, podcasts, blogs, videos, or social media posts? Genre studies may open a doorway into digital literacy pedagogies. You're beginning to see that it's difficult for me to claim that literacy in this classroom was only public or only semiotic or only product oriented. Simultaneously, reading and writing were all these things. To describe literacy as public and semiotic without considering the product orientation would be to ignore an important facet of literacy. In my current work with speech recognition and talk to read, the first graders learned that they could record oral renderings of their stories. When I invited them to share their recordings with classmates, they were commonly aghast. Their audio products were not for classmates or teachers, but for themselves. It may be more accurate to say they wanted to be their own audience. They wanted to create a product that they could revisit. They wanted to relish their increased fluencies. The product gave them this ability. The product traversed time and space. While the public nature of literacy provides an audience, the product nature allows authors not only to share, but revisit their work. As a potter needs to fashion clay, the authors in these various studies need to fashion products. Technology provided product-oriented affordances that paper and pencil lacked. My work in 1995 indicated that students composed public and multimodal texts because they could make products. In my current work with first graders using speech recognition to compose, the technology mitigates challenges to encoding their personally meaningful texts. The first graders are autonomous as they dictate emails to their parents, their own versions of familiar stories, songs, and poems, as well as journal entries and creative stories. They cherish the products that technology makes possible. The third characteristic of literacy in a technology-rich fourth grade classroom was that it is product-oriented. Based on the ensuing decades and continued analyses, I propose a third grounded theory. The nature of literacy in our digital culture will continue and even become increasingly product-oriented. Whether you take photos on your smartphone post to social media, 
or craft a video for YouTube or maybe TikTok. All are opportunities to create products. Because products traverse time and space, it's worth noting that the ethereal, what previously lacked substance, now has substance. Conversations, research presentations, even walks through the park can be captured and shared. In his popular 2011 TED Talk entitled The Birth of a Word, I highly recommend you look it up, Deb Roy of MIT described his longitudinal efforts to examine language acquisition. Using their first child, a son, as his subject, Roy and his wife installed surveillance cameras throughout their house. Here they are bringing home their son from the hospital. And the ceiling cam they installed to capture the moment. Here is their living room and the corresponding ceiling cam. They installed additional cams throughout their home. For three years, they video recorded eight to 10 hours a day and collected a quarter million hours of multi-track audio and video. Roy describes this data set as the largest home video collection that was ever made. He also describes the methodological challenges encountered when making sense of 90,000 hours of video. I'm describing Roy's work to illustrate how he captured the ethereal to create a product that traveled through time and space and therefore leveraged the affordances that allowed researchers to examine what he calls the birth of a word that would previously have evaporated into thin air. Roy crunches six months of data into just 40 seconds. Listen for how his son transforms his oral language from gaga to the socially understood word water. I play this audio sample to demonstrate how the ethereal, the oral word in this case, can become a product and travel through time and space for us to listen to today. While this is wonderful, the fact that oral language can be recorded certainly isn't new. I want to take this recording of oral language and dig a bit deeper. As we know, oral language development doesn't occur in a vacuum. Rather, it's socially and contextually driven. To examine the role of social interactions and context on language development, Roy traces the location and interactions for each time his son was exposed to the word water. Here, digital technologies are used to trace his son's movements across time. His son leaves a red trace. His nanny enters the room. Her movements are traced in green. Roy and his team then tag each instance of the word water, which are traced through the floor plan of their home. Each tag is then followed across time and space to become what Roy calls wordscapes. Herein, the ethereal is not only captured as an audio file, but is embellished with optics that allow researchers to examine the origins of oral language acquisition. Here you can see that the word water, while used throughout the home, was most commonly used in the kitchen. Before the ubiquity of internet connected mobile devices, conversations, actions, and settings were fleeting. They lacked substance. They were ethereal. In our digital world, the ethereal can become a product that similar to the written word can now travel time and space. I see research opportunities. What are the implications of the product nature of literacy? 
How can we prepare pre-service teachers, support in-service teachers, and help educational leaders navigate the product-oriented landscape of reading and writing in our digital world so that all students can harness the potential of digital products? When I entered the classroom in January, Simon showed me the animation he created of Patrick Henry's speech in the House of Burgesses. Simon had created this animation several weeks before I started data collection. When showing this animation to me, he noticed that the setting could use some revision. He thought maybe he should include a reference to the House of Burgesses, maybe the date and some candlelight. Such revisions highlight that the compositions in this classroom were not static. They were transitory. Throughout the year, they were revised. Digital literacies are not only public, semiotic, and product-oriented, but also what I call transitory. In other words, in this fourth grade classroom, compositions were always in flux. This seems to contradict the product nature of literacy. However, it's actually an extension. In, all, in the old days, using an actual typewriter, I typed papers for my teachers. That was it. I turned the papers in, and I never updated them again. I read newspaper articles. And apart from the occasional corrections published the following day, the articles remained stable. In Mrs. Jones's technology-based classroom, students revised their animations and other digital compositions long after they were presented to the class and graded by the teacher. When I asked, would you rather write on a computer or with paper and pencil, students made the following comments to me. Computer, because it's easier to erase. Like, if you mess something up, then you can just delete it instead of erasing it or marking it out. Computer, because all you have to do is move up there and change your mistakes. If you draw with a marker, you cannot erase. But with a computer, you can. The computer can change it. With markers, you start over. I hesitate to point out that it's easier to revise digital texts than text written on paper with pencil and marker. We all know this, right? However, when the transitory nature of literacy is taken together with the public, semiotic, and product-oriented characteristics, some interesting implications emerge. 20 years later, my 2015 research team examined whether this construct persisted. We considered Wikipedia. The basic notion is that a worldwide set of editors can generate a broader storehouse of human knowledge that is continually updated than any central organization such as World Book, Funk and Wagnall, or Encyclopedia Britannica could possibly generate. Of course, the primary feature of wikis is that approved contributors can edit the same document. The same is true of Google Docs. In other words, unlike non-digital products, digital products can be transitory. They can change. The website I visit today may have been updated, altered, and have different content tomorrow. Of course, a range of digital literacies come into play when composing or making sense of transitory texts. Online sources may have been tampered with. Readers must understand how to ascertain what is authentic. The transitory nature of literacy has come to the forefront in our political world where naive inaccuracies as well as malicious disinformation can be made to appear authentic. We all enjoy Snapchat, Instagram, and other app filters. While Zooming or video recording presidential addresses, I can add virtual backgrounds. In, In fact, fact, I'm, I'm in Houston, Houston giving, giving this address. address. Where, Where are you, you all? all? The final characteristic of literacy in a technology-rich fourth grade classroom was that it's transitory. Based on the ensuing decades and continued analyses, I propose a fourth and final grounded theory. The nature of literacy in our digital culture will continue and even become increasingly transitory. Whether you're creating an animation of Patrick Henry's famous speech, reading or writing a Wikipedia article, perusing or posting to social media, or a video sharing platform. There are significant digital literacies involved in reading and writing transitory texts. Readers and writers of digital texts are autonomous, 
or disenfranchised by their ability to navigate the transitory nature of digital texts. In conclusion, I can hear Chuck as well as some of you ask, so what, who cares? Let me attempt to respond. If the nature of literacy in our digital culture continues and even becomes increasingly public, semiotic, product-oriented, and transitory, I suppose the acronym is PSPT. I haven't worked out a mnemonic for PSPT, so I'd appreciate it if somebody could work on that for me. Then we might have some footholds to formulate research and support schools. In our digital world, what do students need to know about audience, solicited and unsolicited? What do they need to know about compositions that can go viral for good reasons and bad reasons? What strategies can they use to remain safe while creating collaborative online communities that promote dialogue and reject bullying? How can students become savvy readers who readily identify misinformation and disinformation? How can students leverage the written word, video, music, sound effects, voiceovers, illustrations, photographs, graphs, data viz, and more to wax eloquent and convey their insights to a worldwide or singular audience? What do students need to join or even invent the collective that heretofore was non-existent? What is needed for students to ride the time machine that is increasingly digital? How can they create digital products that traverse time and space in ways that were previously unattainable? We cannot assume that because students live in a digital culture that they will develop the requisite digital literacies. We cannot wait until students enter middle school or high school to support digital literacy learning. While I do not claim that the PSPT characteristics I've described today are the only characteristics or footholds that might capture the essence of literacies in a digital world, I propose that those who harness the potential while mitigating the challenges of digital literacies are poised to thrive in our culture. We can sit on the sidelines or we can lead the way. I applaud the revisions made to the ILA standards, which emphasize the need to prepare pre-service and in-service teachers, as well as literacy specialists, to understand and teach digital literacies. I underscore the ILA biannual survey of hot topics, which in 2018 found the number one topic was digital literacies. I'm a bit more ambivalent about my perusal of Google Scholar and the possibility that one half of 1% of recent journal articles incorporated the term digital literacies. I have two homework assignments for you. First, here we are attending an online conference. You were required to employ all sorts of digital literacies to present your research this week, and you'll invoke additional digital literacies to attend sessions. There will be online committee meetings, ICG gatherings, evening discussions and receptions. Throughout the week, I want you to be metacognitive of the digital literacies you use. Can we assume that all schools and students are aware of these literacies? understand the interplay of these literacies, and are prepared to provide impactful pedagogies to support the acquisition and development of a full complement of digital literacies. Given your observations this week, what are the implications for literacy research and pedagogy? Before I go, I've got to thank Gwen McMillan, our 2020 conference chair, David Yaden, our associate conference chair, our wonderful and dedicated area chairs, as well as headquarters. This amazing team faced daunting challenges this year to make LRA 2020 a possibility. My second homework assignment for you is, this week, use your digital literacies to tag and thank as many of these folks as you can. Give them some virtual hugs and greetings. At the beginning of this talk, I showed the trailer for the movie, Wag the Dog. Let me explain. As you recall, the spin doctor states, he needs a theme, a song, some visuals, you know, a pageant. 
The SPEN doctor harnesses the public nature of digital literacies to distract the press until the election. He creates a semiotic product complete with verbocentric dialogue, auditory screams, embodied and musical texts that are transitory when he inserts an Albanian village in the background and converts a bag of chips into an adorable kitten. The book became a movie which became a trailer which was posted online. The product traversed time and space to appear here today. To be clear, I'm not advocating that we prepare students to be the best spin doctors they can be. Rather, to be proficient, even savvy, readers and writers, consumers and producers of digital texts. Whether communicating by text messages, emojis, gifies, animations, email, internet searches, internet browsing, hyperlinks, discussion boards, wikis, Google Docs, podcasts, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, live streams, to mention a few, we must provide the requisite research as well as advocate for the autonomy of all learners to thrive in our digital culture. As literacy researchers, there may be no greater honor than to support students' abilities to communicate. When contemplating a title for this talk, I vacillated between including and deleting the word digital. I concluded that when I struck out the word digital, it represented my point. Digital literacies are no longer a separate entity. They are no longer a technology issue. Students live in a digital world. Digital literacies are not optional. Digital literacies have become the literacies of our culture. I leave you with this. The questions resound. Can we do more? Can we do better? Can we support schools and prepare all students to be proficient readers and writers of digital texts? Enjoy the conference. Have a great week. Thank you. Chicken on a roll.